Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Welcome to everybody who's joining me here. It's great to have you. Thank you for joining us online tonight. Tonight we continue on with our series about the Apostle Paul. And tonight we're on our eighth lesson. And the title tonight is Saul and Barnabas in Pisidian, Antioch and Iconium. So I'll explain what all of these are. This picture here is an ancient relief made from tiles of the Apostle Paul. Mm. So uh, I've put this uh, picture up in the background. It's uh, no doubt an impression, but probably reasonably uh, accurate of who Paul is. I just want to mention as we get underway today, also that we're reading from the scripture, but we're also reading from the book of Paul. It's a novel by Walter Wongren Jr. who writes about Paul's life journey. And of course, he is writing in such a way as to bring Paul as a person to life. Whereas we read the scriptures and we hear about what Paul does, where he goes, all those sort of things. But it's less about Paul as a person, whereas the novel is. And so we'll be reading from both. Before we get underway uh, tonight, uh, I've been doing a little bit of study on Paul. And he's described as sometimes a subversive conservative so he's a bit of a, a character he's described as a boundary breaker by others and then by others he's simply described as bald single and blind <laughs> because of course he was blinded by the lord when he was when he had his encounter so he was a bald-headed bow-legged short man with a big nose and an unbroken eyebrow that lay across his forehead like a dead caterpillar. So these are all descriptions of Paul. Now you might find these humorous, but some of these actually come from 100 years after Paul walked on this earth. Mm. And so there's possibly some good truth to what they say. It is paraphrased. It's from the only description, physical description of Paul, and it comes from an early Christian document called the Acts of Paul, and its author, who was a second century church leader, was actually fired over the book that he wrote about Paul because the description didn't um, make him seem, I guess, better than whom he was in his appearance and character. And so a more literal translation of the description of Paul in Greek reads that he is a man of middling size and his hair was scanty and his legs were a little crooked and his knees were far apart, he had large eyes, and his eyebrows met, and his nose was somewhat long. So we get another description of him which talks about similar features. And you might think that this is all great, and it's imaginative writing from a century after Paul died, but it does not clash in the way that he's actually described in the Bible. So if we go to the Bible, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, it actually says his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive. And so they're describing his character in that particular case. So what I want to ask you is, all of these descriptions, why do you think people are so focused on his appearance? He was the man, wasn't he? Well, he was the man. He's one of the people, of obviously the characters of the Bible, especially the New Testament era, who had the largest impact on the world today. So why do you think they focus on his appearance? Even in scripture it talks about he's an unimpressive person and yet they talk about what he said transforming the lives of so many people. I think they're just trying to say that you don't have to be George Clooney to be <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's exactly right. It's not outward appearance. Right, that's mm. right. Yeah. And so if people are going to stand up and share the gospel with people what is the lord looking for anyone 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 and what sort of the ugliest ah. person <laughs> that's me <laughs> and so maybe they'll remember you more if you're not so handsome yeah, yeah. Right? but but the point is of course is that in this modern age we have a lot of charismatic preachers as they talk about yes. but it's not about the show, it's not about the light, it's not about the dress code. The plastic surgery, yeah. It's not about plastic <laughs> surgery, it's not about jet liners, and it's not about all of that stuff, because what we have to do is listen to what is being said. And what we say from here should come from here, not from here. 
And when we do do that and we share our hearts with one another, this is what transforms lives together. And so this is what we need to seek in people. People can use knowledge and they can use it for good and they can use it for bad. But if people use their heart, it usually reveals their soul within. And if they're hurting, they're in pain. Mm. If they're happy, they show joy. Why do we have joys of joyful tears and we have tears of pain? Right? The tears are the result of the emotions that we actually feel, but they're a response to two different emotions. Mm. And so the heart is an amazing thing, where if it was just the mind, it would be very, very clinical. And so Paul is described as someone who is very witty and is very sharp of mind, but the point is, is that his heart's bigger. Mm. You know, he has a heart for God that's huge. And we talked about this before. Why do you think the Lord selected him? He was persecuting the early church. He was persecuting Christians. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death, and that yet the Lord picked him. So why do you think the Lord picked someone who was previously persecuting his own people? He was zealous. He was zealous. He doesn't take no for an answer. So the Lord was looking at his character. The Lord was looking at his heart. He wasn't looking at his physical description. Mm. And he also wasn't looking at what he believed either because mm. he changed that. Right. And so when we grow up in life, we are a product of our upbringing. We're a product of what our parents teach us, what mm. our schools teach us, what history reveals to us. At the end of the day, though, God says that we're all created in his image. We all have attributes that we share together we can all communicate we can all love we can be just we can have mercy and all of those things and they're greater than anything that gets dished up in society when we start talking about descriptions as a group of people here together we all look a bit different but we all share so much in common at the same time and so our geographical sec uh, upbringing our cultural upbringing when we come to the lord all of that gets put aside you know as i like to say our great great granddaddy is noah and that's all of us no matter what our background is where we come from you know obviously we know from having children that we can marry someone my wife is dark skinned and of course i'm white with red hair and my children don't necessarily look very much like me but that's okay. The point is, though, is that we can actually physically change in our parents according to whom our parents are. Yeah. Right? But the Lord doesn't select us based on all those things. He doesn't ask us to share his gospel based on those things. He asks us to share his word, and he asks us not to convince anyone, but we believe that what happens when we read this word, yeah. who works through this word? Who works through this? God. God. So we believe that the Holy Spirit works through this word. Okay? And so when we share this word and it has something to say to you, mm. it will speak to you and it will cause you to have a response to what it says and it will change your life as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And so this is not about me being eloquent of speech. This is about me just doing my job to share mm -hmm. what the Lord wrote for us. And so that's what's mm -hmm. really important. Okay, so before we start also, I'm just going to take a little quick look at a bit of a timeline to give you some reference. Now, there's a fair bit on here, so I hope it's large enough for you to read, but I will, I will read it out. But it starts off that in circa AD 6, that Paul, he was called Saul of Tarsus in those days, so he was born in the top of the Mediterranean. I'll put a map on in a moment. And it says that he was born as a Roman citizen to Jewish parents, though that was where he came from. In circa 20 to 30, he goes to Jerusalem to study this Torah, the Torah. And of course, he studies under this gentleman called Gamaliel, who is in the Bible. And he then becomes a Pharisee. And so a Pharisee is what? How would you describe a Pharisee? If I was to ask you in simple terms. What is, a, what is a Pharisee? I would say, well, they're a teacher of the Torah. Right, so a teacher yeah, of the Torah, yeah. teacher of the law. Mm. And so they went to this, it's like us today, if we want to learn something, we go to a particular school somewhere, 
they have a good teacher there and of course you learn what is there to be taught. So he did this, he was brought up as a Jewish man, he went to Jerusalem, he went under the, the, uh, the hands of this gentleman called Gamaliel and people came from all over the world to be taught by him. He was so passionate about what he believed that he became a teacher himself, so he became a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. Then moving on a few years, uh, across another three years, from 30 to 33, he then becomes someone who persecutes followers of Jesus of Nazareth in Jerusalem and Judea. And so we know by this time in AD 29 that Jesus was hung on the cross. And so, of course, Paul was around. And so people want to argue that point. Paul was around, or Saul as he was originally called in Hebrew, he was around. And so after Jesus uh, rose again, of course this movement, which we call the Jesus movement, as we have on our ministry shirts, basically started to continue to grow and blossom and he wanted to shut it down. It was a threat to him because the belief was different to his. So in Jerusalem, the belief, of course, was in the same scriptures that Jesus learned himself accepting he ushered in a new covenant and they didn't want to have any part of it. So Paul became someone who stood against them. Now in, in uh, 33 to 36 AD, he was on the way to Damascus to persecute what they call new Jews. So they were Jewish people, but they were Jewish people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And he went to Damascus and three years he spent in Arabia after that. But when he was actually in Damascus, we find that he was converted, meaning, and then he started to preach the word himself about mm -hmm. Jesus. And because he was persecuted, he disappeared. The Bible talks about him going to Arabia. It's actually called Arabia Patria. And Arabia Patria is not Arabia as we think about it today. It's actually the Sinai Peninsula. That's what the Romans called mm -hmm. it in that day. Okay, so he went there to escape the persecution. And so his early walk with the Lord is, of course, being persecuted by the very people whom he was representing beforehand. So he had a huge change. And then he returned to Damascus to preach about Jesus as the Messiah. In 36 AD, he flees Damascus because of persecution. He goes back to Jerusalem and he meets there with the apostles. So what did the apostles think of him? Here he was, he was someone who used to persecute them and now he's come along and he's saying, I'm one of you guys now, and they're like, I don't trust you and I want a bar of you. And so there was a lot of controversy um, over that. And of course he had come as a, as a, a, what they call a Greek Jew, so in other words, he was out of a different region, he was not out of uh, Israel itself. And so he wasn't too welcome at that point in time. And he argued about lots of things with them. From 36 to 44 AD, he goes back to Tarsus, his hometown, and he begins to preach in the surrounding region. Okay, and he has a huge impact in that region. From 44 to 46 AD, he's invited by Barnabas to teach in Antioch. So Barnabas was a fellow who was down in Jerusalem. He specifically went up to Tarsus to meet him. And then he came back to Antioch and they started to preach the word. Again, I'll put a map on in a moment just to bring life to this. And again, 46 AD, with Barnabas, he visits Jerusalem to bring a famine relief offering. And what do the people there do? They reject his offering mm. because they don't see him as one of them. And so it's a very sad situation. After that, he goes on mission trips, as we still call them today. He heads off in 47 to 48 AD and he goes on his first mission journey with Barnabas to Cyprus and to Galatia. And so last week we had a look at him going to Cyprus. And then this week he's going to this area of Galatia, which we'll read. 49 AD, the Council of Jerusalem, Paul argues successfully that Gentile Christians need not to follow, follow Jewish law. He returns to Antioch, confronts Peter over questions of the Jewish law. And so this is a huge issue. So... In Jewish law, people have all these ceremonial laws and they're not allowed to eat certain foods. They're not allowed to share tables with people who aren't Jews. And so we have all that religious stuff separating people and causing them to argue. 
And so this is a huge issue, it's still an issue to this very day. Mm -hmm. People think that they can get closer to something by abstaining from something. Mm. Right? But that's not the case at all. And so hence they have this argument. And so this is what they had to reconcile because Jewish people were starting to mix with Gentile people and they became what we know as the church. In other words, it wasn't one type of people anymore, the church was for all people. And so that was a big change. In 49 to 52 AD, second missionary journey, he goes with Silas, so we haven't got up to this yet. He goes through Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey, and Greece, and he settles in this place called Corinth, and he writes letters to the Thessalonians. So these now become books of the Bible. 52 to 55 AD, he stays in Ephesus and writes letters to the Galatians and the Corinthians. And so again, more books of our Bible. 55, 57, he travels through Greece and possibly this place called Arisium, which is today's Yugoslavia, or sorry, not today's anymore, but former Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and he writes a letter to the Romans. And then at the end, his life comes to this point of the rest and the death. And of course, uh, all of the apostles knew that this was going to happen if they stood for Jesus, that they would be basically executed. So in 57 to 59, he returns again to Jerusalem, he's arrested, and he's imprisoned at Caesarea, where we went, Rog, mm -hmm. in Israel, 59 and 60, he appears before Festus and appeals to Caesar on a voyage to Rome. And why is he appealing to Caesar? Because he's a mm -hmm. Roman mm -hmm. citizen. Mm -hmm. In 60 to 62, under house arrest at Rome, he writes letters, again in the Bible, of Philippians, Ephesians, Coloss Colossians and Philemon, 62 to 64, he's released, he journeys, they believe, to Spain, and he writes letters to Timothy and Titus, again, books of your Bible. And finally, in 64, he returns to Rome, and he's martyred, or he's executed. Mm. Remember what happens to him? He was uh, crucified upside down. Yeah, he's hung upside down, upside he's down. crucified upside down. And so he meets a horrific end. And so, if any of us had a life that looked like this, <laughs> uh, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It's a long time ago, but... And so here's a map just to sort of pull all this together. So here's the region. So we've got the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Cyprus over here that we mentioned. This is Antioch, where he first started going up and down from Jerusalem. It's in today's Syria. Tarsus is up here in this region called Cilicia, that is part of what is Turkey today. And from here, he heads off and go across to Salamis and to Paphos. And here in Paphos, he meets the governor, and the governor listens to what he has to say, and he converts to Christianity. From there, they go across back to the mainland, and they head up to these places called Pisidia um, Antioch, which is on today's title and where we're reading the Bible. And then he goes to this place called Iconium. So these are these places uh, that are here. So... Uh, so I'll leave that up behind me as we get underway. But it should give you a little bit of context about Paul's life and his journey. So we're going to, we're going to begin reading uh, from Acts chapter 13 in our Bibles. So you want to open to Acts chapter 13. We're going to go to verse 13. And we're going to read all the way through to verse 14. Uh, so chapter 14, verse 7, but at the moment we're going to start by reading verses 13 to 52 of Acts chapter 13. And in this portion we'll learn what happened on the second leg of his mission trip. Um, and that'll then follow by reading from the novel. And then we'll go back to the Bible to read about Iconium. And then we'll go back to the novel again. So, uh, so we'll begin <coughs> with uh, Acts chapter 13. It said verse 13, so if your Bible has titles in there, it'll say in Pisidian Antioch, which again is this place up here. Okay, so it reads from Paphos, and so this helps us now starting to piece all the elements together. From Paphos, Paul and his companion sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga they went on to Pisidian Antioch on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. 
Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. So I'm just going to mention this. Gentiles mean people who aren't Jews mm. at the end of the day. So he's talking to people who are Jewish and Gentiles. In other words, he's talking to all people. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Saviour Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John, sorry, as John was completing his work, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not that one, no, but he is coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree, which of course means the cross, and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had travelled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. And so, of course, he's recounting this. You've got to realise that he's here in Pisidian Antioch, and so he's talking to people who have no knowledge whatsoever who Jesus is. And in this opening introduction, he recants a little bit of history, and he says that, the, that Jesus was raised from the dead, which tells us all what? He's a joke. Yeah, okay, yes, but what does it tell all of us? What's one of the big things in life that concerns us? Uh, is life after death. Is there life after death? There you go. Do we live life and get to the end, and we get buried and we see bodies going in the ground, and that's it? Or well, is there... Life after death. Life after death now. And so historically recorded as well as in the Bible, Jesus rose from the dead showing that there is life after death. Mm. And so he gives all of us hope that no matter what happens in our life, that when we pass away physically, that there is a life for each of us mm. after death. And so that answers a huge question in life for each and every one of us. So Paul goes here, you can imagine... People don't know anything, and this is the word that he first starts to speak. And so, in society, they live in a world where it's full of ancient gods, and people are being sacrificed to appease an angry god all the time. And here, suddenly, he comes along and says, we don't need to appease an angry god. God loves us, and he actually has an eternal life for each of us. So, a very different message. So, we're reading on from verse uh, 32. We tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers. He has fulfilled for us their children by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 55 verse 3. You are, you, sorry, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. And that comes from Psalm 1610. So all of this messaging is about the fact that when our body dies, that there is a rising that happens after it. So when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his fathers, and his body decayed. 
But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. Take care that when the prophets have said, does not happen to you. And they said, look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. So part of this part of the message is that if I was to ask everybody here, are you able to abide by every good law? Have any of you failed to keep the laws of the land, let alone God's laws in life? And so at the end of the day, this message tells us that even though that may be the case, that what Jesus came to do means that you are washed clean of all of those things that you've actually done. And so this again is a new notion to people who've never heard of this before. Uh, reading on verse 38, oh sorry, beg your pardon, verse 42, uh, he says, As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, so they were travelling together, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. So as Jewish people, they believed that there was a heavenly father, whereas the Gentiles didn't. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. And so the general notion that happened to us today, too, if you went out amongst strangers and people who didn't know the law and you started to preach the word people will generally want to abuse you which uh, i shouldn't be laughing at but it's often the case because when people don't believe or don't agree with something they get their back up and want to put the person down it says then paul and barnabas answered them boldly we had to speak the word of god to you first since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life we now turn to the gentiles so the message is that the jewish people the people from the land of Judah, so they were the Israelite people, they've actually rejected this word. And so they're saying the doors are now being opened for all people to believe. Mm. And so this is a huge uh, shift in the world. And they're basically talking about the fact that they reject it and therefore consider themselves not worthy of eternal life. And so that's a big thing, isn't it? If you actually reject the belief that there is a life eternal through Jesus, then you're accepting death there's no there's no other pathway mm. and so if you want to accept that there's life after death then you kind of have to accept that jesus was the son of god and that he did do this for you and so this is a huge thing to consider and so for people who don't know jesus they would be wanting to know because they would probably be desiring that there is a life after death for themselves and so it reads on, For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus came for all people. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet and protest against them and went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So we see there that they were received, they were listened to, and then those who didn't want to hear the message basically bundled them off and so they left. And so we're going to switch at this point in time to the novel Paul and we're going to go to page 110 so we go to 110 about halfway down the page on 110 and we're going to pick up with the same storyline that uh, pictures around this visit of Paul and Barnabas and it reads now Paul and his company set sail from Paphos around the western horn of the island north to the city of Perga and Pamphylia John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. 
that Paul and Barnabas crossed the Taurus Mountains together and came to Antioch in Pisidia. On the Sabbath day they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading of the law of the prophet and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent word to them asking, Brethren, do you have a word of exhortation for the people? Paul did. He rose to his feet and raised his hands yet higher for silence. When everyone was paying attention, he said, Men of Israel, God fearers too, I speak equally to you all. The God of Israel chose our fathers. He multiplied our people in Egypt. Then with a mighty arm, he led them out of the country, out of slavery. For 40 years, he bore with Israel in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them that land as an inheritance. And so this is the history of Israel right through to today. For 450 years, God took care of Israel and then he gave them judges, 200 years of judges, until Samuel the prophet. They then begged for a king and God gave them 40 years of Saul the son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin. And when he had removed their first king, God raised up David as king, of whom he testified, I have found in David a man after my heart who will do all my will. So let's ask that question there. Why did people want an earthly king? They wanted to look at something to look at. They wanted someone to... Look. So something that ruled them that they can see. Right, that they could see. And so one of the challenges... Sorry? I was just going to say that at, at all the other kingdoms around them had kings. Right. And they didn't. Right, and so they wanted to be like other people and have a king to rule over them. And obviously they wanted to have a king, as we're saying, uh, whom they could actually see, because what's one of the conditions of a human person? They say, I'll only believe it if I can see it. And so faith is the challenge in all of this. So reading on, it says, Now listen, from the posterity of faithful King David, God has in these latter days brought to Israel a saviour, Jesus, even as he promised. Before the appearing of Jesus, John preached the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So, of course, repentance is when we turn. We turn. So some people say it's when we say sorry, but we obviously need to apologise for what we do that's wrong. But repenting is when we actually change our ways. Mm. In other words, in life, there's no point saying something if your deeds don't match your words. And so when we truly repent of something, it means we actually walk away from it and don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is what actually changes who we are. We make decisions in life that, no, that's not right. I'm going to turn away from it and do what is right. But as John was finishing his own course, he said, what do you suppose I am? I am not he, because a lot of people thought he was the Messiah. No, but after me comes one the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, children of Abraham, and you Gentiles who fear God, to us all the message of this salvation has been sent. So this is a word for everyone. But the rulers in Jerusalem didn't recognize Jesus. They didn't understand the prophets whom they themselves read Sabbath after Sabbath. By condemning Jesus, then they fulfilled those same prophecies. So in other words, they were all under the same scripture, under the same law, but they were deciding which bits they wanted to believe and which yeah. bits they didn't. So rather than believing that it was the word of God, they decided for themselves. And then it goes on to say, And though they could find no charge against Jesus deserving death, yet they asked Pilate to execute him anyway. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised Jesus from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those that travel with him from Galilee, people who are now his witnesses. And we bring you this good news. And so on that front, we stand here and I said, we're wearing these shirts, the ministry names here as well, and it's called the Jesus Movement. And these words came from the people, the Essenes, who lived at the top of the Dead Sea at the time, and they wrote about Jesus and the movement, in other words, the people who were following him. And so this is outside of the Bible. So this is evidence of the fact that Jesus was walking here on the earth. Yeah. Um, reading on, And though they could find no charge against Jesus deserving death, yet they asked Pilate to execute him anyway, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. 
But God raised Jesus from the dead, and for many days he appeared, so repeating what we said, that had travelled with him from Galilee, people who are now his witnesses. And we bring you this good news. The promises of God to our fathers, these he has fulfilled for us, the children, by raising Jesus. Thou art my son, God said in the Psalms. Today I have begotten thee. And to support the fact that he raised him from the dead no more to suffer corruption, he said, I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. And in another psalm, Thou wilt not let thy holy one see corruption. But David, when he was done serving God, fell asleep, and then he did see corruption. But the one whom God raised up, that one saw no corruption, so that through him the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him those who believe are set free as the law of Moses could never set you free. And so there's a mention here again that all man sin, and it's only Jesus who can set that apart or set us apart. Beware, beware, and do not scorn this news. O beware, lest this word of the prophets fall down upon you. You scoffers, behold and wonder, and then perish. So this is the scripture we were just reading. For I am doing a deed in your days, but you do not believe it, even if one declares it to you. With that passage from Habakkuk, Paul ended his exhortation. But many people, even before they left the synagogue, went to him and to the rulers, begging that he might preach again on the following Sabbath. Moreover, both Jews and God-fearing Gentiles followed Paul and Barnabas out of the synagogue, clamouring for more. So the message there is they were going to the synagogues and people were following them. They were listening to this news. It was sensational at the time. And so people continued to follow. Continue, Paul said to the people, continue in the grace of God. By the next Sabbath, news of the preaching had raised such excitement that almost the whole of Antioch gathered to hear the word of God. But the size of the multitudes caused envy in the leaders of the synagogues so when Paul rose to speak this time, they too rose up and contradicted him fiercely, loudly, loudly, they reviled him. Paul and Barnabas entered the dispute with vigour. It was necessary, they shouted, that first the word of God be preached to you, but you thrust it aside. You thrust eternal life aside, so now we turn from you to the Gentiles. For the Lord himself commands us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so they're using the very scriptures that the, the Jewish people knew, and they're now using it to actually tell them that this is God's purpose. It's not them doing something which is not what God wanted them to do. God calls us to share with all people. So it reads, when the Gentiles heard this declaration, they broke into an applause that went on and on. They glorified the word of God, and as many were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord spread throughout all the region. But those same Jewish leaders approached certain devout Gentiles, women of high standing, men of civil authority, and using the public enthusiasms as evidence of things to come, caused them to fear persuaded them to persecute Paul and Barnabas and so drove them from the district of Pisidia altogether. When they left, they shook off the dust from their feet as a sign against their enemies and travelled on to Iconium, but the disciples whom they left behind were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to return to the Bible here. But what we see is that Paul and Barnabas went into a Gentile place. They shared the word of God. There was Jewish people who were there. They went to the synagogues, but people who weren't Jews joined them. And when they learnt this word and they heard about the fact that there was life after death, it obviously sparked their interest because what message would they have been receiving? Basically that they should do what they like in this life because there's no life that comes after it. And so this is completely new to them. So when they get to this point, they're chased out of town and then they head off to the next. But behind them... They leave disciples who continue to do that work. And of course, these are the people whom get written to in the future by Paul to encourage them to keep doing the work. So going to chapter 14 uh, in the book of Acts, in your Bible, a shorter passage uh, in, in this section of Scripture, verse 1. We're going to read through to verse 7. 
It says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. So this is, of course, the physical things that people can see, and of course they get excited by it and they believe it because they can see it. Mm. And so obviously when we talk about miraculous signs and wonders, no doubt we're talking about healing and casting out of demons and so forth. Now verse 4 reads, On the people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and to stone them. (coughs) And so stoning is actually a Jewish law, and so if the Gentiles were joining with them, They were supporting their Jewish counterparts under the Jewish law or under God's law to stone them. So verse 6 reads, But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derb and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. And so we start to see a little pattern of what Paul and Barnabas' ministry looks like. They go into a town of mixed people who are Jews and Gentiles. They listen to the word a portion of the society raises up against them and then Paul and Barnabas hightail it out of there and they go to the next place and so they have confidence that there's those they who leave behind who will then continue to disciple the people in that town and this is why in the Bible we find out later on of course Paul starts to write letters to encourage all the leaders of those people that they'd encountered earlier to keep going with what they were doing Okay, so let's now go back to the novel. Not so much uh, humour in this portion tonight because he's normally Paul's getting a bit of a hard time. Um, so we're going to go back to page 112, down to the bottom of the page, and continue reading. And this is where we pick up again at Iconium. It says, Now at Iconium they entered the Jewish synagogue and spoke with such success that a great company believed both of Jews and of Gentiles. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up certain Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Paul and Barnabas remained a good long while, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace for signs and wonders done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with unbelieving Jews, some siding with the apostles, then the Gentiles and the Jews who rejected them, together with their rulers, prepared to molest Paul and Barnabas to stone them, but they learned of the plan and immediately fled the city. They walked about 25 miles on the Roman road from Iconium to Lystra, a city of Laconia, and there they preached the gospel. And so, again, we have this repeat notion. So we're going to go to the next chapter in the book. It's, it's written under the viewpoint of Barnabas, who's obviously with Paul, And it's chapter 21 on page 115. And it reads, They wanted to kill us in Iconium. We had stayed there long enough to make disciples and enemies both, and both with feelings in extreme. Saul had that knack. An absolutely fearless little fighter, a head full of words and a voice like a whip. The farther we travelled, the more I let him do the preaching. Me, I just stood back in amazement. Good guy, hey? Saul would start in a reasonable tone as if to say, Nobody wants to be stupid, do you? Of course not, nor do we want you to be ignorant. And he meant it, he meant it. He, was, he wasn't sarcastic. He had such a thing to tell them and such a need to say it soon, to say it fast, that the reasonable tone of his voice would change to urgency. So then his sentences got longer and the words burst from his mouth like flocks of birds. And the faith of the man was a high wind at the hearts of the people. And some of them gasped in delight. And these are the ones who rose up and flew. But others were insulted and others afraid of the sacred passions. And these are the ones who came to hate him. And that's what happened to sorry, in Iconium. Those who believed in his preaching caused those who did not to become suspicious and scared of the changes in their city. The man's a menace, our enemy said, ruinous to the very order of things. 
why he turns the whole world upside down. So they planned to kill us in Iconium, even the rulers were going to stone us, but our disciples warned us in advance and we fled to Lystra, 25 miles south on a good Roman road. And so this is where we're going to uh, come to a close because this is that portion of those two uh, missionary trips. Uh, next week we continue on where they go to Lystra and Derb and so we can see these places over here on the map. Um, but the message that we get from this is that if you were a disciple and you were heading out to preach to people who didn't believe in the word of God, then what do you expect to happen? Execution. Execution, persecution, mm. right? People don't believe, people think you're an idiot. Right? Hostile people. Sorry? Hostile people. People are hostile, all that sort of thing. Mm. And there's sort of certainly parts, I mean, this part of the scripture that we're reading, it's quite methodical. It's sort of giving us a picture of the journey. It's saying they went from here and they went to there. But if we listen to what's happening in between, basically people are listening. Some people are giving their life to the Lord and then others are turning against them and wanting to get rid of them. But the reason they get wanting to get rid of them, the scripture says, is that it's because they're changing the order of things. So in other words, in life, if this is the lane that you're in and everything looks the same, you sort of, whatever it is, you get comfortable in it, even if it's not right. right. And then someone comes along and says, well, you don't actually have to live this way. You don't have to actually believe that. Here's a new way. And people suddenly start to argue. There's those who want to believe it because the message is better than what they believe now. And there's those who want to stamp it out because it threatens probably their own authority and their own society mm. because they're the people who perpetuate what they believe. And so if you were living in a society, you can imagine, and you were having children and the society demanded that the gods were angry and so they're going to select your firstborn son and they're going to have him executed by fire because they need to appease an angry God so the volcano doesn't blow or because their crops have failed right. or because there's no fish coming out of the fishing boats. How would you feel? Would you give up your son? And people did. And then someone comes along and says, this is just a load of nonsense. There's no such thing as all these man-made gods. Mm -hmm. And they come along and say, in fact, God loves you. He doesn't want you to kill your son. He wants to bless you and people start to think a whole different way. Right. And so today, if you go to India, for example, you'll go to this country with Hindu people and they're building these constant statues, you know, blue gods with eight arms and elephant noses and all this nonsense. You know, they burn incense, they put garlands of flowers around them, they pray to these things and then they set fire to them and float them down the river. And then the poor kids are down the river, they pull them back out of the river, douse the fire, fix them up and repaint them, and they do the same again next year. How on earth do these people believe these things are real? You can't fathom. But the reality is, is that these people are killing people in the name of these things. And so I've shared this before, but you know, a couple of years ago, I received a video from a pastor, which was very disturbing. And it was a live video, unannounced, that I received. And a little nine-year-old girl had gone into a church in India, on the eastern side of India, and she'd heard about Jesus and she wanted to know what it was about. She didn't know anything. She'd been brought up as a Hindu girl, so she wandered into the church. When it was found out that she'd gone into the church, they went in there, they hauled her out by her hair, dragged her out onto the street, and they dragged her down the street while a crowd of people continued to kick her and beat her wow. and strike her and rip her hair out. This is a nine-year-old girl who's curious Doctor. about the name Jesus. When they got to a certain point, they then doused her in petrol and they set fire to her and burned her alive. This is not a movie. This is a live video that was shared to me. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely appalling. But they do that in the name of their gods. Mm -hmm. So do you think that there's a God that you can't see, that you represent in this human way with these aspects of elephants and various colours and all the rest of it, do you think that that's what God wants us to do to one another? 
It's appalling. And yet this is in the world that we live today. It's all around us. And so here in Australia, we go, oh, yeah, whatever, because it's over there. Mm. Right? But the fact is it's going on. You know, we know people who've gone and moved to Uganda who run churches there. One lady that we know had a child that was pulled out of a cage. This child's called Hope, and she was lined up. She was going to be sacrificed. And so she adopted her as her own daughter. She set up a ministry over there in a school. There's over a thousand children there. She takes care of them all now. Mm. That's what God looks like. And that's what God's look like when you're sacrificing to an angry God. And so whatever people believe, the problem is, is that man likes to create their own idea of what God looks like. Yeah. And then they so stupid, they go and worship it. They sacrifice to it and everything else. And so gods in society can be all manner of things. Anything that you, you worship in place of God becomes an idol. Right? If you make something in your life more important than God, you're worshipping a man-made item of some sort. And so it's idolatry. And God tells us, he says, that you're not to worship anything before himself. And so when we do worship something, we make it more important than people themselves whom God created, then of course life goes horribly wrong. And so this is what we're warned not to do. And so we're going back almost 2,000 years reading about this time. We're talking about these ancient names, but these are countries that exist today. You know, Jerusalem's there today in Israel. Syria's there today. These ancient cities can be visited. They're all there. They've all got ruins nowadays. But they're all there. There's nothing in here that we're reading from the Bible that doesn't exist and history doesn't support. So it's truth. And so when we read the Bible, what do we do? We take the Word of God as truth, and then we can go and do what we like in terms of checking it. We can go to these places and visit it. We can read up history. We can go on Google. We can do what we like. And you'll find that it's all there and it's all true. And so when Jesus was here... One of the challenges today is people say, oh, there's something from a long time ago. He doesn't really exist. And yet history tells us outside of the Bible that he certainly did exist. Mm. There's people in this world who are complete atheists who spend a lot of time in their life trying to prove that he doesn't exist. And every single one that's done that has come back and ended up giving their life to the Lord and confessing that he certainly sure. does exist. And so this is one of the challenges in life. So, um, so we're going to continue on with this i hope i've said enough to make you think about life to make you think about our faith it is a challenge for people when we start but in our hearts we know that there's something more to life than being born going to school hopefully getting an education and a good job we get married have kids buy a house and then we die so if that's how you look at life and and like a lot of people do, and they think, well, if I do really well in life, I have lots of kids, I have a bigger house, and all that sort of stuff, but will it make you happy? No, it won't. Right? What will make you happy is relationship with people yeah. and relationship with God and knowing that there's something more to life than the everyday that happens. Right. We know we live in a world that's broken. There's lots of problems in this world. And if we took mankind out of it, there wouldn't be any problems, right? Because it's all about people. And so if we take care of one another, then life can be very, very good. And so that's really what's important. And so if we boiled our faith down, we would say that it's about good relationships with one another and with our Heavenly Father. Right? And so we'll say amen to that.